This is the video for Tuesday, September the 7th, Industry. The idea of mercantilism states that a colony shall not have industry. The colony is to ship raw materials to Great Britain. Great Britain will then take the raw materials and turn them into finished goods and send them back. However, because of salutary neglect, the colonies created industry. Now, the biggest industry was shipbuilding. The colonies had lots of wood. They could find things to make rope. They could get a hold of tar. Now, most of the naval stores came from the south, particularly North Carolina. Most of the ships were constructed in New England. New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, all had fine ship factories. Shipping became probably the biggest industry in the colonies. But there were other industries. These are what I would call consumer industries. You have to have shoes and so each colony had people who made shoes. You have to have clothes. Each colony would take wool and spin it into thread and then take the thread and turn it into some type of a fabric which could then be sewed into a garment. Now in New England and the middle colonies, this is where you're going to find most of your factories that make shoes or clothes or iron. To get the products from here to there, these American ships are going to take products from America to Africa and then back to the Windy West Indies and then up to the American colonies. They're going to take uh, they're going to take another triangle trade from the colonies to the south of Europe. They're then going to go to England and exchange them for finished goods and then bring them back. In some cases, they're going to go from the colonies down to West Indies. They're going to take the fruits of the West Indies up to England where they then offload and pick up finished goods and then back. There are quite a few of these triangular trades. Now I'd like to show you the video, but YouTube has been blocking my video, so we're going to skip over this. It normally takes about, this video would take about five minutes. Each colony was built on agriculture. Every colony had farms. Now the soil conditions in New England was quite bad. And because of this, they produced, but not at the same rate of, say, the Middle and the South. The Middle and the Southern colonies had a great deal of good soil, and this soil turned into abundant crops. In New England, because of the poor soil, New Englanders practice what is called subsistence farming. Now, subsistence farming is where you only grow enough to feed your family uh, throughout the fall, winter, and early spring. Now remember, you're going to have to plant things that you will be able to preserve for the late fall, all of winter, and early spring before you can start putting things out that you can eat fresh out of the garden. Again, in New England we have what is called subsistence farming. Subsistence farming was also found on the edge of the colonies. If you were to go, say, into western Pennsylvania or western Virginia or western North Carolina or western South Carolina, you would find that the people there are trying to cut down the trees and, and make themselves a place to live. These small farms that they create could probably only have subsistence farming. Now, in the middle colonies, and that would be New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, in the southern colonies, that would be Maryland, Virginia, the two Carolinas, and Georgia, we have what are known as commercial farms. Now, the commercial farms are farms that produce so much of a product that the excess can be sold 
to other colonies or to other countries or to back to Great Britain. In Pennsylvania, New York, and I think we could add to this New Jersey, we're going to sell mostly grains. Now remember, the grains that are going to grow best in these three colonies would be wheat and barley. If you ever see corn on a quiz, you, you might want to avoid that one. Because corn is something that is unique to the Midwest. Now in Virginia, and I guess we could also add uh, Maryland, we have tobacco. Of course in North Carolina we had naval stores. In South Carolina we had rice and indigo. Each colony will extend many miles beyond the sea by the time we get into the 18th century. Now the land nearest the sea is going to be the priciest because if you're near the sea then small ships can sail up rivers. You can offload your cargo onto these small ships that would then sail to bigger ports if they say the cargo was getting ready to go across the ocean. The area near the seas were called the Tidewater region and probably the priciest Tidewater region was in and around Chesapeake Bay. In and around Chesapeake Bay you have many rivers, the bay itself is enormous and all of the land that touches either the Chesapeake Bay or the rivers that touch the Chesapeake Bay would become part of this Tidewater region. If you wanted to be a somebody, you would want to go to the Tidewater region. Now as you approach the Appalachian Mountains, now please understand the Appalachian Mountains are divided into segments. We, with, with Bacon's Rebellion, we talked about the Blue Ridge Mountains. If you go farther south, they're called the Smoky Mountains. As you go farther north, they're called the Green Mountains and the White Mountains and the Adirondack Mountains. But these are all part of the Appalachian Mountain chain. Many of the settlers who came to the colonies would go out to the frontier. They would buy small particles of land with a small amount of money, and then they would hope to conquer the land. Some frontiersmen won't even buy the land. They'll just go to land that they think nobody wants, and there they will make their small farm. Education. There was no such thing as public education in those days. Now, if a colony had large settlements, then education might be given to the students. Each colony would be taxed, and the money from this tax would go to an established church. Now, this is only true. This is not true for Maryland, because they had the. Uh, Religious Toleration Act, and this would not be true for Pennsylvania because they said that no church should receive tax money. But for the other 11, the established church is going to receive the money, and if you want your child to be educated, you had to have your child as part of that faith. Now, the farther south you go, because the settlements are few and far and in between, most of the education will be done in the homes of the plantation owner. We're going to do some name changes. Now when Virginia was formed, of course we had the Church of England. But during the Glorious Revolution, England is going, excuse me, when the Stuarts become king, the England is going to merge with Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And because of this, the Church of England is going to take on a new name the Anglican Church. Now, just about any church that has a royal colony in which the, the charter is in the hands of the king is going to be a colony where the Anglican faith is probably the greatest. So we could say by the 1700s, we could say New York and New Jersey. We could say Maryland, uh, Virginia, the two Carolinas, Georgia. These were all of the Anglican faith. But we also find Presbyterians and Methodists. Those who are from Scotland, those who are from Wales, and I think, I think Wales in this case has an H in it, 
are going to be mostly Presbyterians and Methodists. They, uh, they were kind of opposed to the Anglican Church. Now, in New England, we know that around 1700, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which was Puritan, and the Plymouth Colony, which was Pilgrim, are going to merge. The, the, the Puritans are going to be less strict. The Pilgrims are going to be in such small numbers that they're going to merge. The dissenters of the Puritan faith are going to merge. They all agree on a common faith. This common faith is called the Congregational Church. Now, by the way, the Congregational Church is still quite prominent in the New England area today. So in the 1700s, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut would all be part of the, all part of the Congregational faith. Maryland still has a sizable number of Catholics, but the Anglican outnumber them. New York, as I said, is Anglican, but because of the Dutch, we also have Lutherans. New York is also going to have the first Jewish temple to open. Pennsylvania probably had the greatest diversity of all. We know that Pennsylvania was started by Quakers, but because so many Germans came to Pennsylvania, we're going to find the Mennonites, which is a very strict Protestant faith, and we're also going to find the Lutherans. These are people from Germany. Now, in 1720, the colonies are going to go through the Great Awakening. Now, periodically, in our history, we have had times in which the colonies, or later the states, would have a great revival in their, in their religion. And the first great revival occurred in the 1720s. Now, ministers had told that, were telling people that salvation could be achieved by reading from the Bible. Now, remember, Calvin said back in the 1500s that you were predestined. A minister by the name of George Whitfield is probably going to be the greatest speaker during the Great Awakening. Now, Whitfield is going to speak in every colony. It is believed that Whitfield was seen by seen and heard by a third to half of all colonists. People would come far and wide to hear from Whitfield. Now, Whitfield would have a quote from the Bible, but then Whitfield would wing it after that. But the basic message of Whitfield was that salvation could be achieved by reading the Bible. Now, of course, this is something that got Ann Hutchison in trouble in the previous lesson. Now, there is a video that goes with this, again, because of YouTube blocking some of my videos. I think we will move on from here. This takes about seven minutes. Before this time, Protestant churches had been built on the principle of predestination. Whether we're talking about the Church of England or the Puritan Church, they believed that salvation was determined by birth. But this new, this new religion, this new faith, had a new philosophy as well. It stated that good deeds and understanding of the Bible could achieve salvation. Now, of course, we are asked to do good deeds by our minister or a priest. And the hope is that by doing these good deeds, we will achieve salvation. This is also a time when Europe was coming out with the Enlightenment. Now, the Enlightenment is an idea based on reasoning. This first came out in what we, what we would call the scientific method, where we had an idea, a hypothesis, we would test the hypothesis, and then after testing the hypothesis, we would look at our results. Well, couldn't we do the same thing with our life? Couldn't we come up with an idea? Couldn't we come up with ways to test this idea and then look back and see if these ideas were correct? 
Now, Europeans began this, and then about the time we get into the 1730s and 1740s, it had come over to the 13 colonies through reasoning. We believe that we could reason our way to paradise. The Enlightenment brought us a new form of faith called deism. Now, many of the Protestant faiths deal with deism. Deism is the belief that God, through observation in nature, may decide not to intervene in human affairs. Many deists, when they pray to God, don't pray for God to make their little dog eat better or to let them win a game. They, most deists believe that God really doesn't care about this. What God cares about is do you gain understanding through reading the Bible. Now, many deists reject organized religion at all. This is something you might want to talk about with your religion teacher. Deism is quite popular in many of the Protestant faith, but not as popular in the Catholic faith. Well, we are getting very close to the bell in the classroom, so we are going to stop here. Uh, we have a quiz on Friday, September the 11th, so make sure that you're ready for that. We have lots and lots of maps work to do. I would say of the 20 questions, at least four of them will be from the map. Make sure you know your terms. Make sure you know how each colony was created. That becomes awfully, awfully important.